am terrifically honored to be here today. I think what Data and Society is doing is a very, very important project, and I only wish there were another hundred of you in New York. Um, I'm also somewhat humbled and feeling profoundly square by comparison, um, not just because I'm wearing, about the only person wearing a suit, and that doesn't happen to me very often in New York, I can tell you, um, but also because, as most of you know, my day job is I run the Financial Times in North America, so I have a pretty corporate existence. I will just say, though, before I talk about what my new book's about, that before I became a journalist, some of you may know, I actually trained as a cultural anthropologist. I did my PhD out of Cambridge, and I did field work looking at Islam and ethnic identity and female identity in a place called Tajikistan. Um, I doubt if any of you have been to Tajikistan. No, well, I come from a fairly classic anthropology background steeped in cultural studies and women's studies and ethnic identity and things. Um, so I have a sort of fairly broad brush of what I look at. And that very much informs what my um, book is about and what I'm very keen to talk to you about and what I'm very keen to hear your thoughts about because I do touch quite a bit in my book on the question of data. Um, but I'm not a data expert. I know most of you are. So I'm very keen indeed to make this about as interactive a session as I can. Now, this book arose because back in 2007 and 2008, I was doing the very, very unhip, very geeky job of running the financial coverage for the Financial Times, looking at the markets and banking sector. And when the crisis erupted, it was very common for my friends, for fellow journalists, for politicians to turn around and say, well, the reason we had this crisis is because those wretched bankers were either completely mad, completely evil, totally greedy, or really stupid, or probably all four at once. And I'd look around the world at the people who I knew who were working in finance, and I'd think, well, yes, there are plenty of greedy bankers out there, um, maybe one or two of them are a bit evil, maybe one or two of them are a bit mad, but that is not the majority. Most of the people I know who are working in finance are people who, if not well-meaning, are doing things that kind of made sense within the context of where they were operating. And the issue really was the context. Because when I looked around at the financial crisis, or rather looked around at the financial system, what struck me was there was something about finance that people, for the most part, were not talking about at all and are still not talking about it. And it's that finance has been and is fantastically fragmented. Great irony that we live in a world where the financial markets globally appear to be hyper-connected, where shocks can be transmitted around the world at lightning speed. I mean, I rushed here this morning because you know, we are consumed this morning with the fact that you know, shocking events in China are now rocking things in the US. Um, there's tremendous sense of connectivity. And yet, although we live in a world where we have the impression or the illusion that we are hyper-connected, in the sense that shocks can be transmitted across the globe very fast. If you look at how institutions are actually structured and how people think and organize their lives, we are as fragmented as ever, perhaps even more so because we don't notice how fragmented we are, partly because of technology. What do I mean by that? Well, as you just heard, I have a background um, working in Tajikistan. Before that, I worked in Pakistan and Tibet. Um, and when I first came onto Wall Street writing about finance, you know, bankers would often say to me, oh, you've been studying tribal structures in Tajikistan. What earthly use? What good is that in looking at Wall Street? And I'd sort of look at them and think, well, if only you knew. Because if you look at your average investment bank and go and talk to the HR department, they all have these wonderful organogram charts showing how theoretically everybody is supposed to be interconnected to everyone else. If you actually look at how pa power plays out inside a Wall Street bank, and Karen Ho, who might be known to some of you, brilliant anthropologist who did a wonderful book on the anthropology of Wall Street. If you look at how your average investment bank actually operates, they are as tribal as anything you might ever see anywhere around the Himalayas. Power goes up and down in vertical hierarchies. People have allegiance to individuals. And for the most part, information is not shared. And they're competing viciously between the tribes for resources, for accolades, for those nice fat profits and bonuses. <laughs> 
And that really mattered in the 2007 financial crisis. If you want to understand why it was that banks like UBS, which used to be super safe, and I tell this story in some detail in my book, ended up doing things which were not just spectacularly stupid, but spectacularly damaging, you can see the answer in these tribal structures. The left hand didn't know what the right hand was doing. Um, UBS had 3,000 risk managers who were paid supposedly to monitor risks, which was wonderful except for the fact that they operated in a little silo of their own and didn't talk to the bankers, and they were actually divided into three separate tribes of risk managers themselves who didn't talk to each other. But the other problem was that you didn't just have structural silos, structural tribes. You also had what I call mental silos. You had the problem of tunnel vision. You had the fact that bankers were so beset by <coughs> their environment that, for the most part, they couldn't see how incredibly limited their worldview was and how incredibly dumb many of the things they were doing if only they'd had an interconnected, joined-up view. Again, you can see that from the way that bankers were operating inside a group like UBS. But you can also see it in the public um, sector um, institutions too. I mean, I firmly believe that one of the reasons why central banks and finance ministries were incredibly blind to the risks building up in the system before 2007 or 2008 was that they had this very rigid mental distinction in their minds in the way that policymakers and economists have been trained, which said basically you had one thing called macroeconomics sitting in one box, which was studied by one group of people, and they did things like monetary policy. And then you had another group of activities called financial markets activity or regulation sitting in another box, and those were things in the weeds of finance with weird names like CDOs. And the two things were basically kept separate, not just structurally, but mentally. And because of that, for the most part, the central bank simply, simply could not see the crisis or the scale of crisis which was brewing. But it wasn't just a question of private sector banks or public institutions. It was also the way that the media operates and that, well, that we all tra are trained to think. I mean... I first joined the FT back in the 1990s, and I worked on the economics team. And within the status and hierarchy of the FT, that was a very high status place to be. We had nice offices which overlooked the river, River Thames in London, and we sat next to the editor's office in a very nice position. Um, I later went and worked in the capital markets team and ran our markets coverage. And that group basically sat on a completely different floor overlooking the garbage cans. And we were about as far away as it was physically possible to be from the economics team. Again, because there was this widespread presumption, this widespread, if you like, acceptance of these social, structural, and mental silos that made that seem normal. And at the time, we never questioned it. In retrospect, though, that was just one thing which helped to reinforce this sense of fragmentation, which was so pervasive. Now... I initially thought that was really a problem of finance, but in 2010, I moved to America to do my current job, sort of running, overseeing our American operation of the FT. And one of the first stories I had to cover was the BP oil spill in the Gulf of Mexico. And I remember sitting late at night, reading through the copy that some of my journalists had done on that, and suddenly being hit by this horrible sense of deja vu, and thinking, well, hang on a sec, if I took out the word BP, and replaced it with UBS, you'd kind of have exactly the same pattern. And it then became something of, of an obsession with me, looking around the modern world today and seeing time after time instances where these big institutions had essentially blown themselves up or done really dumb things because of these mental, structural, and social silos. You can see it in the private sector. I mean, if you delve into the story of General Motors, if you delve into the story of, you know, Takada airbags, if you delve into so many of these stories, you see this pattern play out. But you can also see it in the public sector too. I mean, why do the CIA officials, why do the, the intelligence services prove to be so incredibly unable to see what was ca coming with 9-11? Again, you see the problems of silos. If you look at healthcare, pro uh, healthcare systems, I know we've got people here from the healthcare world, um, again, you see a pattern where you've got incredibly fragmented healthcare structures, not just in America, but particularly in America, which are creating very bad outcomes. 
So I became really consumed by two questions. One is, why does this happen? And secondly, what can we do about this? And on the issue of why it happens, um, as I sat there and thought about this pro problem, I became increasingly fascinated by the whole issue of anthropology and what it can basically do in terms of helping to shed light on these questions. Um, I don't know, how many of you in the room have trained as an anthropologist or studied anthropology? A lot of you, great. Well, that's a lot more than I usually get when I talk to bankers, I can tell you. <laughs> um, I mean, I'm passionate about the value of anthropology. Um, not so much in terms of you know, the actual subject matter, what it studies, but really about the prism that it sort of, or chip it inserts in your brain once you've studied it, in terms of being able to look at situations and contexts and really have the perspective of being an insider-outsider. You know, I believe very strongly that the core tenets of anthropology, as I understand it, in, namely looking bottom-up at societies, trying to take a joined-up view, looking at the gap between rhetoric and reality, what people say and what they do, and above all else, using this idea of comparative analysis, looking at one society, not just to understand that society, but so that you can look back at yourself in order to actually make sense of yourself and see just how weird you are. You know, I passionately believe that that's a set of tools and approach to life which needs to be adopted much more widely and frankly which the anthropology community itself needs to stand up with a loudspeaker and shout to everyone else that we matter and we have something to offer. And when I think it comes to looking to silos, I think there are really two or three um, important points that anthropology has to offer. Um, the first is the very obvious one, which is that in some ways, this problem of fragmentation, this problem of silos, is really just a reflection of being human. I mean, one of the things that anyone who's studied anthropology will know is that you know, every single society in the world that anthropologists have ever studied has a classification system embedded in its culture. In some ways, classification is culture, and culture is classification. Um, and the reason for that is very simple, that if we as human beings don't have ways of arranging the world and putting it into mental buckets, if we don't have a way of creating order, we just can't survive. We're drowning in too much data, too many people, too many ideas. We all need to have the equivalent of a mental filing cabinet in our minds and in our cultures just to get stuff done. So out of that sort of mental filing cabinet, really our issue of silos of fragmentation emerges. And there's no point in saying, well, the best way to deal with silos is just to abolish them, because guess what? It's a bit like saying, well, let's abolish our human nature. You cannot get rid of our need to classify the world. But the second key point that anthropology sheds light on is that you don't have to necessarily be trapped into just one way of organizing the world. Precisely because anthropologists look around the world in different societies, they know there are more than one ways to organize your, if you like, your sock drawer, your mental filing cabinet. Societies have different types of classification systems. And out of that really comes the third key point, which is that I firmly believe that in some ways the best way to try and deal with this silo curse is fragmentation. This problem of being trapped by, if you like, classification systems we inherit from the past is to take the attitude of an anthropologist, be an insider-outsider, to try and step out of your context, look at how you classify the world, ask whether it's appropriate, and if it's not, try to do something different. Sounds incredibly obvious, but actually it's not, because most people most of the time never even think about the fact they classify the world. It's so completely inherited from our surroundings, from our, our environment. It's so completely part of our habitus. And I use the word habitus because that's very much the framework of Pierre Bourdieu, a big French intellectual, who shapes a lot of the way that I think about this and who, again, I draw on very heavily in my book as an intellectual framework for thinking about this. So just to get back to the real world, when I looked around in, the, if you like, the second part of my journey of inquiry, to try and find examples of companies and individuals and institutions which were not so much blowing themselves up because of silos, and there were dozens of those. I mean, you probably can think of all of other ones aside from the ones I talk about in my book. But I looked for examples of people that weren't trying to blowing themselves up, which were trying to tackle the silo problem. What I found over and over again was essentially people who were employing many of these principles of anthropology, 
often without actually using the word anthropology per se. But trying to start off by one, recognize that we're classifying the world, secondly, think about whether it's appropriate, and thirdly, find better ways of doing it if it's not. And one of the key points that occurred to me as I looked around the world is that this is not just a question of not blowing yourself up. It's not just a question of not having a financial crisis or not being like UBS and failing to see big risks. It's also a question about trying to look for opportunities. Because if you stop and think about it, whenever you look at organizations or people who are really innovative and creative, often what they're doing is essentially breaking down silos, jumping across boundaries. They're silo busting. People who are innovative are often doing what we sometimes like to call thinking outside the box. But more accurately, they're often first recognizing that other people have boxes and then trying to shuffle them bound and question those boundaries and actually mix those boxes around. So in my book, I tell a series of stories about companies and individuals, true stories, who were doing just that. Um, won't go into them now because I've only got seven to 10 minutes and I've, I'm already over my time, sorry, Martha. Um, but I tell stories like Facebook, what they're doing internally to try and break down silos internally and avoid becoming a disaster like Sony. I mean, to my mind, what's happened to companies like Sony, what was happening until recently to Microsoft, um, Xerox, all of that is classic examples of the silo problem. And a group like Facebook have had an unusually articulate conversation internally about how to avoid it, and they're trying very hard. Tell the story of Cleveland Clinic and how the doctors there have tried to completely turn the mental map of medicine upside down in a way that is not just quite innovative in medicine, but I think has really big implications for almost any other profession too, including journalism. The principles that Cleveland Clinic are using to turn that mental map upside down are very, very interesting indeed. Talk about the Chicago police. Um, attempts they've made to try and use data to break down silos. I talk about a hedge fund um, which has tried to take a silo-busting approach to make money. Dirty secret of finance is for every single bank doing something really stupid because of silos, there's another canny investor somewhere that's making money by seeing how stupid that bank is being and running rings around it and essentially silo-busting to make money. One person's silo is another person's opportunity. But the last story I want to leave you with very, very briefly is the story of New York City Hall um, and the data stuff they've done there. Um, probably something that many of you are familiar with. How many of you know about what New York City Hall's done in recent years, Bloomberg, with the firefighting and yellow grease? Okay, well, I'll give you the serious one and then the less serious one. And the more serious one is um, New York City Hall, like most local governments, is fantastically siloized. I mean, just absolute epitome of the kind of silos you can get in any large bureaucracy. Um, Bloomberg came in and wanted to break them down. Um, he did it you know, partly by using architecture and you know, dragged all the senior officials into, out of their offices, their marble rabbit hutches, into an open plan um, hall to try and get them to talk to each other. Um, but aside from doing that, didn't make a lot of headway elsewhere in the organization in terms of breaking down silos. Um, but one little corner where they did actually make some quite interesting experiments was with a group of data scientists run by a man called Mike Flowers, former lawyer. Um, and he came in, and his idea was, well, it's almost impossible to break down physical human silos inside New York City Hall. But the great thing about data is that it doesn't have a union. It can't go on strike. Um, and if you remix your data, you can get some very, very interesting um, results potentially to break down silos. Um, at least you can if you actually stop and think about it. And the first place he tried to do this was in relation to, f to detecting which buildings were going to be fire traps, fire risks across New York City. Um, and he did something which is probably incredibly obvious and familiar to most of you, which is that Whereas they'd been traditionally trying to predict fire traps by using 311 data coming from the fire department, which was completely useless because the only people who actually report likely fire traps live in Manhattan and wealthy areas where there are no fires. And the people who actually live in places where there are going to be fires, fire traps, tend to, guess what, not want to voluntarily call 311 and draw attention to themselves. So the fire department data was useless. 
Um, he had the idea of basically trying to take pools of data from different corners of the bureaucracy across New York City Hall, put it together, use basic predictive data, data um, modeling techniques, and guess what? At a stroke, the fire prediction became five times more effective in terms of working out where fire traps were going to happen. Really, really obvious thing to do, but nobody inside New York City Hall had thought of doing that before, not just because they hadn't got the computers, but because the silos were so deeply entrenched in their minds and their organizational structures that the idea of trying to get the environmental department and the tax mortgage department to work with the firefighting department and actually look at it together just wasn't there. Um, my favorite story, though, is Yellow Grease. Um, and in many ways, this is a really, really good news story. Um, who here knows what Yellow Grease is? Okay, one of you. Great. Okay, well, you can correct me if I get it wrong. Um, basically, yellow grease is what happens when you go to your favorite New York restaurant and order spring rolls or, or chips or French fries or anything else, and it's deep fried, and there's a whole bunch of fat left in the pan after they've cooked the meal. And essentially, there is a lot of yellow grease in New York because there are a lot of restaurants and a lot of fryers. And in theory, restaurants are supposed to get rid of it by paying a waste disposal company to come and take it away. Um, in practice, many restaurants don't because they don't want to pay and because they've watched The Sopranos and they've seen what waste disposal companies are supposed to do. So there's been a time on a tradition of restaurants tipping it down the nearest manhole cover, usually at three o'clock in the morning. And it's pretty disgusting. You know, you may not know it, but there are big fatty deposits in the New York sewage system of yellow grease. So what Mike and his team did was, and, and New York City Hall has had no hope or no chance of actually catching the yellow grease dumpers, because guess what? They dump at three o'clock in the morning, and there's only about two and a half people in New York City Hall who, do, who, who look around at these 20,000 restaurants. So Mike Flowers and his team said, okay, Let's try and do the same predictive data techniques we use for firefighting, fire traps, and apply it to yellow grease. And they did some fairly obvious things in retrospect, um, brought together different pools of data, created a matrix, and guess what? They identified the, the likely yellow grease dumpers. But then they took another step. They said, well, somewhere in the giant New York bureaucracy, we have another department that almost no one knows about, which is dedicated to biodiesel recycling. Why don't we go and actually ask those likely yellow grease dumpers if they'd like to recycle the yellow grease and sell it to the biodiesel companies? So again, it sounds obvious, but they went out and did that. And for the first time ever, the bureaucrats in the, in the um, biodiesel recycling unit started working with the restaurant department, et cetera, et cetera. And some progress was made in trying to deal with the yellow grease problem. This isn't going to change the world. It's not rocket science. This isn't massive breakthroughs. And I say, when you look back at it in retrospect, it's incredibly, incredibly obvious, particularly to you lot. But the key point is this. We live in a world beset with silos. We can't deal with it by just saying, let's just abolish silos any more than we can turn around as human beings and say, let's just stop getting angry. It ain't going to happen. But we don't have to be mastered by them. If you actually turn around and try and master them, employ your brains and think, you don't just avoid blowing yourself up. You can actually be innovative too. But data alone won't do it. We have to employ our brains too. Because otherwise, we simply end up trapped by these silos that we inherit without even noticing. So I'll stop there. I hope that's convinced all of you who aren't anthropologists to become anthropologists. And in the meantime, I'll hand over to a bona fide anthropologist, which is Martha. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so just to do a little bit of translation, I thought we'd have Frank, our fellow who has actually worked for a company. Uh, <laughs> um, ask some questions to ease us over. 
about what somebody who is the leader of a company or works in the company might read of this book and take from it? Well, so, so actually, the, the first question I was going to ask, um, and, and just so that folks know, I work for Microsoft. Um, and uh, we are trying to overcome silos. Um, I've experienced yeah, some so of that Your, di your D leader was very, very articulate and forceful in telling me how he was going to overcome silos. And, and, and progress is being made, happily. Um, but I wanted to ask you an initial question about your intended audience for this book. When you, when you first set out to, to put it together, um, just given your background in financial mm -hmm. services, it seems to have a lot of implications for other uh, uh, other audiences. So just wondering what you had in mind of who would read this and what they would take away. What, what would premise would you want them to walk away with? Um, well, I guess my audience really was the, you know, intelligent, you know, readers of the Financial Times who are not just working in finance, they're working in a range of different fields. Anyone who's involved in public policy making, in businesses, in institutions in general, in a wider sense. Um, and by the readers of the FT, I don't mean people who are actually subs ex explicitly subscribing, although they jolly well should be. Um, I mean, um, you know, anyone who's basically interested in how the world works in a joined up way. Um, and I can't emphasize strongly enough that this is really meant to show that it's not just about finance. It's very easy for us all to turn around and say, oh, those idiot bankers, and somehow think this is not a problem that affects everyone, because it does. So w when you were thinking about the examples um, uh, and, and, the, and the stories that you tell about the, the different companies, it seems like uh, that there's a, a breakdown. Um, one is around... Uh, organizational structures and what they need to do to bust the silos. But then the New York City example seems more of a kind of individual taking it upon him or herself to solve a particular problem mm -hmm. and kind of work across an organization. Maybe not to bust silos in, in the organizational sense, but more kind of on a project by project basis. Um, so my question really is, how did you decide what to include and not include? Because if you take a look just at Silicon Valley, there are also some cultural silos mm -hmm. that you know more and more is coming out about the need to be more diverse in Silicon Valley. Um, is that is that the second half? Is that like a third a, a second book coming out on on those yeah, sorts yeah, of issues? Because it, that seems to be a logical place also yeah. for the overlay of the anthropolo anthropological aspects of this. Well, that's a really good point. And basically. Um, you know, I'm trained as a journalist, so I'm trained to tell stories. And the stories that work best, whether it's in Hollywood or the FT or the Bible or anywhere else, tend to be stories about people. And, you know, you, there's a limited amount of information the human brain can take. So naturally, you know, we do best when we have specific narratives. So I already looked out, to try, looked out for several narratives I could use to, to illustrate these stories. They were not chosen in a massively scientific way. I'm sure there are dozens of other stories I could have chosen which would have been much better. And I get a lot of emails from people saying, oh, you talked about UBS. Why didn't you talk about AIG? You know, AIG is much worse. Um, you know, I chose stories I thought would try to illustrate the point um, and be true. Helps. Um, the question of, you know, cultural silos, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I think one of the problems about, so, you know, I tell the story of Facebook, um, which I think is fascinating because they have done some really interesting things to try and break down silos internally. Too early to say whether it's going to work in the long term. Um, but certainly thus far it's been interesting. One of the reasons they've managed to, I suspect, create slightly less fragmentation internally is partly because um, the Facebook employees are extraordinary when you go around and talk to them. And I spent a bit of time on the campus um, talking to them and doing hackathons. And, you know, for the most part, I was given quite good access. Um, anyone here work at Facebook? Or worked before? No. Well, they're a bit like, interviewing Facebook employees is a bit like sort of, you know, cutting up a stick of rock in that they all used to cut them all up and they all look flipping identical um, in the sense that, you know, I'd ask them all these questions and they all kind of came out with the same answers. And I used to think, gosh, is that because they've all been sort of, you know, got at by the PR team beforehand? Um, but I think there really is a very strong shared mindset, shared culture in many ways there, which makes it easier to move people around the organization and easier to get across organizational um, communication. But it also makes it very easy for them to end up in a silo of their, of their own, as you say, cut off from the rest of the world. So 
you know, you can get silo breaking on one level, but then at the cost of creating a silo on another level. It's a problem. And, you know, my book doesn't offer easy cut out and keep solutions. It's more really a sort of clarion call for people to think about the issues um, and to at least engage in some process of self-reflection and self-awareness. So and th that actually leads into my next question. So w what advice would you give the next Mark Zuckerberg versus, say, a, a rank and file um, uh, you know, recent college graduate looking to enter into, uh, say, the tech sector? Um, well, do you, you talk you a little bit about the, the, the boot camp um, yeah. at Facebook and just wondering if there's any more detail there, you know, around the, how to, that works. It depends whether you mean, it, you know, uh, am I saying what can leaders do of organizations to try and silo bust once they're big? What can leaders of small wannabe organizations do when they're startups and entrepreneurial? And what can individuals do? Because those are three different things. Um, in terms of what individuals can do, you know, I'm a passionate believer that A, we need to start thinking about how we classify the world and actually stop and recognize how much of you know, our classification system we inherit unthinkingly from our surroundings. Um, we need to recognize really clearly of the degree to which we live today in what I call Generation C, Generation Customization, where because of technology we're given the um, you know, idea, sense of entitlement that we all should be customizing everything all the time. Um, I first noticed that in relation to my own daughters going into Starbucks and ordering the secret menu. Um, but customization is absolutely endemic to the world today. And what that means is that we all tend to get sucked into this idea that we customize information and news sources and friendship groups and our identity to the nth degree. And we pull ourselves into sort of these very bespoke intellectual rabbit holes and become more siloized, more fragmented without even realizing it. Um, and if you don't understand, who in this room is here is, is on Twitter? Okay, everyone. All right, great. Um, how many of you have ever looked at the people who you've chosen to be in your Twitter feed, basically to follow on Twitter, and actually asked yourself, how many people in my group of people I'm following are basically from my own intellectual and cultural and social tribe? You know? Some of them you have, great, well, that's fantastic, okay? because frankly, I didn't until recently. But if you want to understand how easily siloized we can become in our own thinking and living, um, it's worth actually trying an experiment. And actually, it was Dick Costeller who first suggested this to me, because this is what he does, or he did before he got kicked out. Um, basically, you, know, you look at your people you're following on Twitter and say, okay, for two weeks, I'm going to knock out you know, all of them if you want to go cold turkey, or half of them and replace them with a group of people 180 degrees different. So put in Donald Trump, put in ISIS, ISIS. I mean, I know it sounds outrageous. Put in people completely different from your own lives and just see what kind of information you'd get. It's a very interesting example, you know, thing to try because, um, you know, it shows you how, you know, how we're all getting sucked silently and seductively into these little rabbit holes without even noticing. Um, but so that's on the individual side. I also believe passionately in people need to be willing, if they can, to take risks and jump across boundaries in their own careers and lives. Um, you know, I've done that in my own life. You know, I've been lucky in some ways, but I also think it enriches everyone's life. Um, you know, Steve Jobs used to say, you can't join up the dots looking forward, you can only join them up looking back. And I do believe that very strongly. Um, that's individuals. Entrepreneurs, very briefly. Um, point one is, you know, apart from read my chapter on Facebook, but think about how what happens when small startups grow big very rapidly. Because most small startups don't have silos, they're too small. As soon as you get above a perfect size, certain size, they start to emerge and can be deadly. Um, and it's better to think about it in advance rather than too late. Um, but also recognize that one person's silo is another person's opportunity. And when startups go out and disrupt big companies, um, what they're often doing essentially is taking advantage of the fact that convergence is happening faster outside the company than a big company can actually cope with because of its internal silos. And often what startups are doing is w riding a wave of convergence more effectively. It sounds very theoretical, but I can give some examples of that if you want. Um, and then for leaders, think about silos. Think about how to break down silos internally. Um, and above all else, have the courage to embrace a bit of slack in your organization because it's very hard to break down silos without having a bit of slack 
one reason why silos keep erupting today is because we have this cult of efficiency, which basically forces everyone into more and more clearly defined boxes, and that out of that, really dumb silos come. So, so I know f probably from your conversations with Martha that you're at least a, a little bit familiar with the, the work that data and society does in terms of um, looking at different issues, um, everything from data ethics, how big data is used in, say, the criminal justice system, in the education system, around human rights. Um, so I, I think Summit Data Society would, would view the work that the, the organization does as kind of uh, silo busting mm -hmm. in, in, in a certain sense. What three or five habits would you tell us that we need to do or continue doing um, to make sure that we don't fall into the, the traps of uh, the silo? OK. Um, one is I'd play the Twitter experiment on a regular basis. Um, you know, I mean, the reason why Doc Costello first started talking to me about this is fascinating is because um, Twitter is very, very interesting in the way it's evolved in, in the last decade. It, it symbolizes a problem in the modern world. You know, when Biz Stone and the others first dreamt up Twitter, they imagined it as being a bit like a cyber bar, a cyber pub, where it would be kind of a place where everyone kind of bumped into everyone else and they all congregated together in one great happy mass and they all flocked together um, as a group, you know, this flocking obsession. Um, and in the first year or two, Twitter was so small that in some way they kind of did that. But like anything, once you explode in size, you begin to get fragmentation. And you know, when, when we were talking about silos and tw Twitter with Dick Costello, you know, he said, Basically, Twitter now is so ginormous, so gigantic, that I have no idea what's happening most of the time because it's fragmented and subdivided into these little kind of separate subchats. Um, and you know, people, for the most part, when they're given the choice voluntarily whether to be part of a wider group and silo bust or basically retreat to where their own little comfort zone is, everyone tends to re retreat to their comfort zone and stay there if they possibly can. Hence the issue about who you choose to follow in your Twitter feed. Um, but I'd say, you know, trying to mix it up, trying to, you know, change your Twitter feed is very important. Um, trying to get different voices is very important. Um, trying to play the kind of mental experiment of Cleveland Clinic in the medical world and say, okay, what would happen if we were to look at our organizational structure and turn the whole thing upside down? And instead of defining ourselves with boundaries driven by producers, i.e., the way that we're trained, what would happen if we were to define ourselves with boundaries created by consumers or the problem that we're trying to solve and worked backwards? How would that look? It sounds abstract, but I can give some examples of that if you want. Um, I think those are some of the key things I'd say. Does that count, that count as three? That, that, that's quite enough. And, and final question, a, a, anything that you would Oh yeah, and last oh, but not least, okay. read some anthropology. <laughs> Pierre Baudieu. <laughs> Uh, and so, so final question, at least for me, and then I think we'll, we'll open it up or I'll hand the mic back uh, to Martha. Any, anything that you found um, that would have been nice to include in the book or that you wanted to include in uh, the book and that, that you didn't? Wow, where do I start? Um, I would have liked to talk much more. Originally, I actually, originally I actually had a chapter on Twitter in my book, um, which was looking at the issue of social fragmentation and social polarization. Um, picking up on you know themes that have been touched on by a number of the people already up at MIT and out on the West Coast. Um, we took it out in the end because we felt it was worth another, another whole book in itself. Um, but you know that's something which I think is very important, this question of social polarization right now. Um, and then just you know lots, lots and lots of other interesting companies, both on the good side and bad side, I would, I would have liked to write about. Great. Well, thank you very much. Thank you. So I just had a few questions on behalf of the discipline of anthropology, yeah. uh, just out of an obligation. Um, so first, have you seen the movie The Big Short? I have. OK, so do you think that the woman in the bathtub, played by Margot Robbie, is a stylized version of you? <laughs> what? <laughs> I only wish. <laughs> have you guys seen it? Any? OK. Have a look at the lady in the bathtub who's like the distinctive blonde with the distinctive Commonwealth accent. I really think that she's supposed to be like a movie version of Jillian explaining the CDO to the public. 
Well, if I lost 20 pounds and grew another two feet and basically <laughs> you had can, my teeth whitened, maybe. <laughs> you can thank the, the casting director yeah. for that one. Yeah. Um, so in technology, the anthropologist has long been a recognized figure, unlike in banking. Mm -hmm. There's less to resist on this side. And computer scientists have sometimes collaborated with anthropologists to design products. So what was really amazing for tech anthropologists about what you did in finance was you said, you're not really inviting us to talk about your products, but I'm going to do it anyway. Mm -hmm. And as a journalist, you went in and you said, let me diagnose how this product was made and how maybe it's not working out for you the way you thought. Mm -hmm. So you transformed yourself into a tech anthropologist. Are there actually jobs for tech anthropologists in finance? And are there any people who actually t have taken you up on that approach? Wow. Um, I never thought of, my, of myself being a tech anthropologist before, but it sounds fabulously cool. Um, I, okay, point one is I'm told by people like, you know, the Red Consultancy and others that there's a big boom in companies seeking out anthropologists right now. Um, really for two or three reasons. One is that as companies become increasingly global, they realize that consumers have an irritating habit of not behaving as they presume they're going to behave. Um, and so they need to understand different cultures a bit more. Secondly, their own workforces are becoming more global. Um, and, you know, there's a recognition they need to actually start thinking about it. Um, and so, you know, whether it's a company like Ford, whether it's a company like, you know, Intel, the tech companies is quite well known, the consumer companies. And there is an effort to look more at anthropology. Um, finance has been a massive, massive laggard in, that, in this respect. They have the impression or the illusion that money is an acultural thing that um, basically, you know, it's the same in any language, any culture. Um, that simply isn't true. Um, financiers also have the impression that they are driven by these rational visions of economics, which strips a human and strips culture and politics out of the equations. Again, I mean, I was um, up all night writing a column saying how ridiculous that is right now, particularly given the state of the global markets. Um, so I think finance is lagging behind. I hope that there is more use and more recognition of anthropology and finance, but I fear it's probably going to be one of the last bastions. Okay, so I have to take you up um, on the point about, I never use this word, I'm going to use it now, capitalism, because mm -hmm. anthropology has certain concerns about it discipline. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to draw a distinction between the discipline of anthropology mm -hmm. and what you advocate in the book, which is the practice mm -hmm. of ethnography. Yeah. Um, so the discipline of anthropology has become particularly resistive as a badge of honor to the idea that economic growth mm -hmm. and the spread of certain economic models is necessarily going to be good for anyone and everyone. Mm -hmm. um, and in your book, when an entity like a hedge fund um, like Blue Mountain makes money, mm -hmm. it isn't distributed to everyone evenly, and it's not a social good. Mm -hmm. So in this book, where is the question of social equity mm -hmm. in the kind of yep, uh, silo busting? There's definitely, there's definitely a, an element of anthropology which is not about observation, but about um, prescription, and about social campaigning and activism. Um, and that is not something which I'm trying to address in this book. Um, you know, I happen to have, you know, uh, quite strong political views on a number of issues, um, but that is, for the most part, is not what this book is about. Um, so do I think it's morally correct that a group like Blue Mountain can make the scale of money it is making? Do I think that it should be taxed and plowing it back into the rest of the economy? Do I think a world where hedge funds can go and do this kind of stuff is a sensible or just or intelligent way of operating? Um, you know, do I think a, a, an economy that's driven by this kind of, you know, impersonal, semi-detached money culture is a good thing? No, I don't. Um, but that's not what I'm trying to talk about in this book. What I'm trying to talk about is the fact that really um, this sort of rather interesting, you know, issue that um, taking a hard look at social patterns and cultural patterns and the unspoken um, f patterns that shape our lives um, is something which can be very powerful in many contexts. And not doing that can equally be very dangerous. 
So they're different things. But yes, I completely agree. I mean, you know, somebody like David Graeber, um, for whom I have boundless respect, um, would take a very upfront activist um, approach. And, you know, I also am keenly aware that, you know, um, there are plenty of anthropologists out there who would regard the fact that I even work for the FT um, and even go and talk to um, capitalists wearing suits as a sign that I've comprehensively sold out. And I'm very willing to talk about that. <laughs> I went through the honor of having my Wikipedia page defaced repeatedly by uh, angry anthropologists. Um, but equally, you know, it doesn't change the fact that I actually think that anthropology as a discipline is wonderful. I deeply respect what many anthropologists do. I happen to agree with a lot of, a lot of the activist criticism of anthropology I would agree with, but I'm not necessarily in the same ca camp as, you know, many anthropologists. Um, so for my last question before I open it up, I think one of the things about your book is that the silo is the, as, is the problem of a particular kind of organization, and it's the opposite problem of what we have coming mm -hmm. from the tech world, whose basic organizational frame, or the thing that we admire, is the network. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, but in a way, what data and society is about is the recognition that tech has innovated something that is maybe the biggest silo buster out there, mm -hmm. which is data. Data is the thing that runs in between. Data is the thing that moves. Data seems to be the thing that if we bust a silo, we go to data, mm -hmm. which is, there's an element of that in your book. Yeah. Um, what if when we try to bust the silo, what we get is some of the problems you describe, like greater fragmentation, mm -hmm or a bigger tech sector, or more powerful hedge funds? Yeah. I think data is one of the most seductively dangerous and exciting things out there today. Um, data has the ability to connect the planet more, more effectively than anything anybody could have imagined just two decades ago. It's absolutely astonishing what's happened. Um, data has the ability to break down many of the categories that we use to organize our lives and essentially look at the world through entirely fresh ways because at this point the data does not have a union and data need not have pre, um, preordained set ways of dividing the world up in the way that human minds and human cultures do. The problem with data is the very fact that it appears to connect the world so seamlessly can basically seduce us into not noticing the way that we're customizing our own lives into more fragmented patterns. Um, it's very seductive. Um, and the other problem with data is that data will only break down silos if you actively think about it and employ a human brain to think about how to actually interpret data, collect data, organize data, store data, and then read and use it. I am passionately um, supportive of any efforts that people are making today to build up the field of tech anthropology, um, you know, people watching, um, what Sandy Pentland <laughs> would call social physics, um, because I think that is the future. Um, I've, I took part in a fascinating event at MIT last year um, where basically the argument was that, you know, traditionally you've had anthropologists who look at the world on a micro level basis because they, they do deep observations one at a time of people with their own eyes. And then you've had, you know, academics who look at the world from a macro level basis in a very shallow way, be it an economist crunching th through statistics um, or sociologists looking across the entire planet. And you've had this kind of micro level individual idiosyncratic analysis or you've had this shallow macro level analysis. What big data in some ways allows people to do for the first time ever is do intensive micro level analysis on a macro level. I mean, it's absolutely revolutionary what can be done if you start combining the human analysis with big data and the numbers. But academia has been siloized too. You know, there are the, pe the tribes of people who look at touchy-feely anthropology things tend to be on a different planet from the people looking at computer scientists historically. I hope that's changing now, and I totally salute what you guys are doing, I and mean, that's what I said at the beginning, totally salute what you guys are doing to try and bring those fields together. I mean, it's critically important what you are engaged in in this room, and very, very exciting. It's exactly why I wish there were 100 of you in New York, because there needs to be. Um, my very last point I'll make is on the issue of anthropology. Um, you know, anthropology, in some ways, is its own worst enemy. 
because if you look around the modern discourse today in the wider public and the political environment, you know, e economics is there all over the place. Psychology now is dead trendy all over the place. History, we all know about. Anthropology has not been plugged into the public discourse. And one reason is that, as um, Levi Strauss said once originally, that anthropologists you know, tend to be people who prefer to hide in the bushes and grumble rather than get out and do stuff. And that's partly because the skills you need to people watch and observe and do ethnography generally are not, for the most part, compatible with the skills you need to get out and perform in public on a stage. You know, quiet, patient observation, making yourselves unobtrusive, requires a sort of level of, you know, quiet, if you like, humility. That is a wonderfully admirable concept, but those are not natural hustlers or natural egomaniacs of the sort that many people in the economics profession are. Also, anthropologists, as you know, precisely because they're paid to go about organizing, sorry, analyzing institutions, um, you know, tend to think that institutions and politics and establishment groups and money are all pretty dirty and they don't want to go anywhere near them. Fair enough. The problem is, if you want to get your voice on the world stage, if you want to explain to people the value of what you're doing, you have to get out of your silo and dance with the devil a bit, if you like, and actually get out onto a stage, talk about anthropology, and deal with institutions, and if you like, shove it down people's throats. And you know, I wish that you know, so many anthropologists are so doing such amazing work that nobody outside their little tiny corner or silo knows anything about, knows anything about. And that's a tragedy. I guess we all need our own bathtub in a movie. <laughs> um, questions, guys? And if there are any anthropologists, you can tell me I'm wrong. Hi, my friend is watching online and has a question. Um, oh, wow. This is, <laughs> this is the connectivity of technology. Fabulous. Um, so what are the advantages of a silo structure? And as we're building new models, like what can we bring along? OK. Silos have advantages. Um, you know, and again, the Facebook chapter in my book tries to explain that actually you can you know, try and use the value of silos alongside being aware of the dangers. Um, silos encourage more focus. Um, they often encourage more accountability. Um, they often allow people to move fast and break things, to quote Mark Zuckerberg, or the cliche there. Um, you know, they actually enable stuff to get things done. You know, it's very hard to have a constant chaos. Um, you know, they can encourage people to develop faster professional skills and more technological expertise. So those are all good things. Um, you know, we don't all want to be operated on by a random medical employee chosen at random from a large, you know, 2,000 word hospital. We'd rather have a specialist neurosurgeon, if you like. And a team of specialist neurosurgeons talking to each other is likely to have better qualities of skills than, you know, an isolated neurosurgeon all on their own. But equally, if that neurosurgeon only ever talks to other neurosurgeons and does not talk to neurologists and does not talk to other medical disciplines and fields, then you have a bad outcome too. Um, I have a whole list of questions here, but um, I'll try and take the one that uh, captures it most. This, this whole idea of, of dancing with the devil um, fascinates me. Uh, <laughs> and we could talk about that all day. But uh, in the spirit of data, and all this talk about serendipity and mixing with other people and capitalism uh, measuring uh, without everyone being hedge fund corporate raiders. Is anyone measuring uh, or betting on the value of serendipity? You tell this surgeon to go out and talk to someone else. For how yeah. long is, um, do we give them? Google gives people 20% to work on their own projects. Is anyone betting on that, shorting it, longing it in the financial markets to give capitalists incentive to this idea of mixing it up? Um, I don't know if anyone's betting on it as such. And one of the problems is, um, you know, it comes back to a much bigger question, which is how do you defend the value of slack? And by slack, I mean the ability of a company to say, OK, you know, in any given week, employees can have half a day off to go out and bump into someone new and talk to someone different. You know, how do you defend the value of actually having a system to rotate people? Because rotating people is actually a time-consuming um, costly endeavor, you know, inside an organization. You know, how do you defend the value of taking everybody away from their desks for like, 
a night once every two weeks and having a hackathon. It's very hard to defend that um, you know, internally. And actually, I would argue that leadership today of any organization entails having the courage to stand up and actually defend that quite strongly in the face of budget cuts and you know, the public clamor for efficiency at all costs. Um, how do you measure the power of serendipity? I don't know. But here's a little example, which I think is always fascinating. Um, you know, in today's world, there is no obvious reason why anybody should ever get on a plane and go to a conference. Because, you know, um, the power of the telephone, the power of video links, the power of Skype, you know, all of these things mean that we should be able to get all the information we ever want and all the contacts and connectivity via you know, digital technology rather than physically getting on a plane and traveling across the world to go to conferences. And yet, um, as somebody who spends a huge amount of my time going to conferences um, and as someone who looks at the FT and how it's trying to develop its business model over the current years, the conference business is going absolutely nuts right now. I mean, it just grows and grows and grows and there appears to be no limit as to what anyone will pay to go to conferences. Um, you know, I'm going to Davos next week, and, you know, it costs the moon to go to Davos, and yet numbers keep growing. It's, it's astonishing. And I think that's partly because, you know, it's partly because people want to hang together with their tribe and reassert their identity. And, but it's also because the power of serendipity and the sense of being able to bump into people at these conferences and actually, you know, forge new contacts, new links, um, and actually bump into new ideas is very, very forceful. Um, so can you model the value of serendipity? Absolutely not. But what you can see is that when people are too narrowly trapped into rigid buckets, um, there's usually a cost involved, whether it's a missed opportunity or a missed um, ability to see risks. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, so you mentioned about some of the shortcomings of promoting some anthropological findings. I wonder if you have a kind of wider critique of ethnography and how you deal with those, um, those other issues, if you do have them. I mean, ethnography has endless critiques that you can throw at it. And you know, one of the reasons I love anthropology is because, guess what? Anthropologists are more critical of themselves than anybody else can possibly be. I mean, one of the reasons I got out of anthropology, academic anthropology, is because I got so frustrated with the fact that the discipline in the 1980s um, and early 1990s, at least in the UK, spent much of its time basically defining itself out of existence and saying, well, actually, you know, there is no point in doing ethnography. It's, you know, it's sort of riddled with contradictions and flaws, so why are we doing it? Um, you know, ethnography tends to be subject to the biases of the person doing the ethnography. It has historically been limited. There's an ever-present pre tendency to extrapolate from the individual and small scale onto the macro. Um, those are all big flaws and biases. Um, but I would argue that the other ways that we look at the world today and done inquiry, such as top-down statistical analysis by economists or theoretical pontificating by historians, um, you know, and telling the story from the perspective of the elites and the winners, which is what much of history does, um, or looking at the world through the prism of sociology, which again tends to be very macro level, they are flawed too. So like most things in life, it's a question of the lesser of evils and trying to mix up different approaches and having the humility to recognize the limits of every academic approach. Um, the other way of saying it is, I also happen to think that and having an anthropological approach, an ethnographic approach to life, both in terms of the eth ethnographic methodology, but also some of the theory of anthropology, which I haven't touched on for the most part, as Martha says, I'm mostly talking about ethnography, if you want to be technical about it. You know, I often think another way to look at it is it's a bit like adding salt to food, that actually some anthropological perspective on many other forms of analysis, be that technology, be that economics, you know, is often richer with a recognition that human culture matters intensely. Hi, um, thank you for your talk. I'm gonna try and articulate this because I'm worried I'm not gonna be able to do that very well right now. Um, you spoke of a couple different forms of silos here. So you mm -hmm. spoke about the silo within UBS, uh, which is more kind of a group siloing effect. 
And you also spoke of silos that you say are emerging due to kind of increased fragmentation through mm -hmm. things like Twitter. Um, so my question is, you know, a lot of these kind of customizable features of the internet, um, I think probably arose out of silos, right? Um, out of this desire to overcome silos. So really like they're incredibly interdisciplinary spaces where yeah, you'll go for things that you tend to interest you but every single person is different and so maybe I follow everybody in the data and society community but I also really like cooking so I follow a bunch of other things and I also really like music so I also follow. And the chances that somebody will share my exact same footprint, I mean, it might be common. I live in a big city. I see a lot of people who are a lot like me, um, but probably less common than, let's say, within one of these group silos. So the question is whether or not that same kind of logic is operating mm -hmm. behind something like the hackathons that Facebook is promoting. Okay. So they're saying that you know people will have their own various interests and they'll be able to go mm -hmm. and pick what they want to do and through giving people the freedom to pick these things that might be you know, in accordance with these like silo boxes that you're talking about um, within like the Twitter framework, um, but that might have some sort of positive effect. So I was wondering if you could speak to, <laughs> I don't know if there's a question here, but, um, there's a, but also like what this unifying structure is that you're saying that Facebook has that overcomes these silo boxes that are then okay. fueling all this other action. Well, I think you actually touched on a great point there, and I can see where you're going. And I didn't talk about in detail about the Facebook story because you know I didn't don't have time. But the briefly, one of the things that site Facebook does is to one recognize that they need silos internally to get stuff done. You can't have everyone trying to write the same code, so they dedicate they create dedicated project teams that each have specific tasks or specific areas of expertise. You know, you have a team that's writing, you know, stuff for, I don't know, the like or whatever else um, function. Um, but then having created these specialist teams, these product departments, these silos, they try to stop the boundaries of those teams hardening too much and becoming too inward looking and they're more competing and trying to kill each other or not swap data. Um, by you know rotating them quite a lot, by mixing them up quite a lot, but by, but by also recognizing very explicitly that they want to create a framework, a network, a web, a spider's web of social contacts between those different teams that cut across those department boundaries. And one way they do that is by having what they call boot camps, these experiences whereby everyone who joins Facebook joins at the same time and undergoes a common um, training course for several weeks, which they call boot camp. And in theory, that course is designed to teach them the, the same code. In practice, that's bollocks because they could all learn it in an afternoon. It's actually to make sure they have a common experience together and create social ties. So that when then when they scatter to their different teams, they have people they know in the other groups that they can call on or bump into. And you know, Facebook designs this campus so that everyone bumps into everyone the whole time. But they just have a second point of contact. If you like, it's a two-dimensional structure. They have the, the special teams, but they also have webs of networks which cut across those teams. And then they try to create a third web of networks, which is basically having, encouraging people to create all these kind of interest groups. You know, if you are a kayaking enthusiast at Facebook, you know, you're positively encouraged to go and hang out with the other kayakers and talk about your kayaks together so that you actually have a contact with someone else in another team again. And it's about very much recognizing that we as individuals are never one dimensional. We always have many facets and aspects to our lives. And, you know, we're often encouraged in our professional life to actually focus on just our main professional identity or our main departmental identity. But if we flip it around and say, actually, you know what, it's fantastic that we have multiple identities because guess what? That can be one way to try and break down silos and to connect to different worlds. Um, and to come back to your point about what happens in social media, I mean, there's a lot of research now into patterns of Twitter usage and Facebook usage trying to um, work out whether that it, those are creating polarized conversations or not. And I'm conscious that probably most of you know more about this than I do. 
But if you look at the work done by people in um, Bloomington, Indiana, if you look at the stuff that Dana, Dana himself, herself has done out of, um, I think it was Savannah, Georgia, um, Georgia Tech and things like that, you know, what the pattern you find, and it's been replicated in Qatar in relation to the Arab Springs and everything else, what you find time and again is that, um, you know, on the one hand, social media creates very polarized conversations and it encourages people to cluster into tribes. But there are always nodes of contact between those tribes where actually data leaks across, conversations leak across. I mean, the hashtags in the Twitter create nodes of contact between different tribal groups because the same different tribal groups will see, use the same hashtag. So if you search for stories under hashtags, you actually get exposed to people outside your tribe. Um, in Facebook, there's quite a lot of evidence that people share um, important news out of their own little Facebook group um, using these secondary third um, elements of identity, you know. So one way to break down siloization inside companies or inside real life is to actually actively celebrate the fact that we are all multiply, uh, we are all individuals with multiple identities. And just because we're emphasizing one at work doesn't mean that others shouldn't be encouraged too. Does that make sense? Long-winded question, I know, but I'm almost out of time. Long-winded answer, I mean. Project. Okay. Hi. <laughs> I'm a hospital-based physician, and listening to you speak was, was very interesting, and in particular, I really want to hear what you have to say about the Cleveland Clinic. Just quickly about the, the practice of medicine that I, I live in. We, we live both on the micro level. We deal with the patient directly. We mm -hmm. get our data from epidemiologic level scientific studies, so we sort of live from the micro to the macro spectrum on a daily basis, most of us. Mm -hmm. We have sort of built-in mechanisms to protect against silo to coin a term. So I routinely consult a gynecologist or a cardiologist or a nephrologist. I work with uh, nurses and dietitians, and so on and so forth and obviously deal with the, the consumer, the person who uses the healthcare. What was it that was specific about the Cleveland Clinic, its problems, its silos that you saw and how they fixed it? Okay, three things. Um, firstly, well, first of all, I should say I deeply salute you for what you're doing and I even more salute the fact you're here because you are actually engaged in personal silo busting yourself, um, which is fantastic. You know, I imagine you're ex exposing your mind to a range of other people and things. I bet you've never dealt with an anthropologist before. So it's brilliant. So thank you. And I'm very pleased to meet you. Um, secondly, okay, it's coming back to the th three things about Cleveland Clinic. One is most of the American healthcare system is based on an eat what you treat system. Um, you know, it's not quite eat what you kill, which is Wall Street, um, but basically eat what you treat, where you basically, it's fee for service. Um, puts America into a bit of an outlying camp globally on this point. Um, but, you know, I would argue the legacy of that means that um, there's often incentives to duplicate treatments. There's often incentives to not collaborate as fully as you might do, simply because, guess what? People want to be paid, you know. They don't necessarily want to be paid as a group. Um, Cleveland Clinic, along with Mayo Clinic and others, has a you know, partnership salary-based model, which has historically tried to reduce some of that, um, some of those incentives or some of those disincentives to collaboration. Point one. Point two, though, is a much bigger one, which is that um, Cleveland Clinic basically start, you know, they started with the point that medicine, like many other areas of life, like economics, has a very deeply well-ingrained. Um, way of classifying the world, taxonomy of the world, which is so deeply ingrained that people generally don't actually question it, which is that there are one group of people in one box who are paid to cut up other people for a living, and they're called surgeons. And then there are people, a group of people who are not allowed to cut people up, which are basically physicians. I'm being very crude here, but tell me if I'm wrong. And then there's all the support staff. And, you know, that's a pattern, that's a distinction that served medical experts very well because that's how they were trained in the past. And it's this basis a distinction on which many hospitals are structured and which, you know, insurance fees are often paid, etc. Um, but the point that Cleveland Clinic made was that firstly, um, the way that many medical innovations are occurring today, say with cardio cardiology stents, um, is actually blurring the boundary between surgery and physicians anyway. Um, secondly, that actually if you look at how individuals 
and consumers of health actually experience medicine. Um, they use a very different model in their minds of taxonomy. You know, they think of medicine as being to do with, you know, my heart hurts or I've got a stomach pain or I've got a chest problem. And they wouldn't say, you know, they want a, you know, a cardiologist. They'd say, oh, you know, I just don't feel very well. So essentially, one of the things that Cleveland Clinic did was to try and rearrange the map of medicine inside the hospital around body parts and ailments instead of around surgeons, physicians, support staff. So to put it crudely, instead of having cardiosurgeons hang out with you know, neurosurgeons and others, they're trying to encourage cardiosurgeons to hang out with cardiologists and whatever they call cardioradiologists or whatever. I mean, the jargon in, in medicine is even worse than finance. Um, so that's one group of things they've been trying to do. The second thing they've done is to say, actually, again, doctors tend to operate in a world where they've been trained to think that there's one set of things called technical medical skill, and then there's this thing called touchy-feely emotion and soul. And they kind of operate in different camps. And again, if you look at how human beings experience medicine, they don't make that distinction. And their judgment on whether or not a hospital is good and whether or not they feel better in hospital, you know, is partly about the quality of their stitching on their wound, but it's also about whether their bed's dirty or not. It's about the entire experience. And so again, trying to redefine the world around the entire medical experience, rather than starting off with preconceived um, de de definitions between you know, doctors, nurses, et cetera, um, again, has led to a different type of approach in terms of how they do the care. Um, it, I mean, there's a very, you know, narrow um, interest or there's a particular incentive Cleveland Clinic has to do this, which is, of course, these days, um, increasingly healthcare payments are made on the basis of consumer experience, not just technical skill. Um, and, you know, since Cleveland Clinic has changed its approach, it's shot up, shot, shot up the rankings of shot up the rankings on the experience um, surveys and things. But trying to reimagine medicine and do things like send your surgeons off to Disneyland for um, lessons in customer care is all part of trying to rethink that mental map.